This is the first reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 17, verses 22 to 24. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, continuing to verse 17. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him. I should probably repeat that verse. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for you, or I should say it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that no one, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone away. The new is here. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel portion It's from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. Two parables, again, probably very familiar with us. Please stand as we honor the teaching, we honor the Messiah and his teachings to us through his word. The good news, brothers and sisters, according to Mark. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or get up, the seed sprouts and grows, and though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. Soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, 
as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now I told everybody that they had to turn their cell phones off. But I'm just going to keep mine here so that I don't get carried away. Is that okay? All right. Brothers and sisters, sometimes I think the lectionary is masterful, how they put their readings together. Sometimes I struggle trying to think, wonder why these readings are the ones we have to read today. Sometimes I look at the text and I go, wow. This is a nice little collection of figurative images, metaphors of trees and plants, something small that seems inconspicuous or or insignificant um, that somehow yet grows to be obvious, that attracts attention to the Lord. And in the prophetic portion, it's the initiative of God himself to go and take a shoot from the top of the branch and a tree and, and a cedar tree and plant it somewhere in the mountains of Israel. And then in the parables we see in Jesus these tiny little seeds that, that continue to grow and, uh, and flourish and, ex- and expand, something that seems so insignificant, but yet becomes such a treasure and an honor and a glory for the Lord. Then there's which uh, I really like, and, uh, and we'll reflect on some of those as well. So just drawing your attention to the Ezekiel portion, sometimes our readings occur um, not in context, they just sort of appear. But in the context of the prophet, where uh, the Lord is talking about planting uh, the, the, the shoot or the branch of a cedar tree. It's in the context of um, a failure by the kings of Israel, particularly Zedekiah, who did not um, know or understand the politics of the time. And instead of paying vassalage and homage to Babylon, he attempted to uh, join with the Egyptians. These two big empires, Egypt and Mesopotamia, were clashing. Poor Israel's in the middle, so I guess they had to pick a side, and they picked the wrong one. And, uh, and they got carted away, and the temple was destroyed for a variety of reasons. The role of Israel, the task of the, of the people of God, was to be the people of God and a light to the nations. Now God comes along. And in a very prophetic way, and it is uh, often taken in a very messianic way, God himself will take the initiative in this big cedar. He will take the top off. He will plant. He will nurture. He will defend. This little plant will grow and nourish. It will give honor and direction to the Lord. And it's taken um, primarily as a, as a, as a um, prophecy of the Messiah. Not a problem. In Jewish exegesis, though, there are multiple ways to read each passage. And we should, I think, remember that. Uh, they call it the, the minimum uh, of four ways, the parades. Initially, you read a passage and it's, you just take it literally. Here we have a prophetic portion. Then there's a, 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 a remez, a hint, some sort of allegory. What is this alluding to? Is it the Messiah? Could be. Who else could it be? Who else could the Lord pluck and take and nurture and grow? Yes, Messiah, but perhaps also a new people of God who would grow and reflect and uh, give honor and glory to his name. And then there's the hope, particularly in a very dark time where our leadership had failed and our kingdom had been destroyed and, and uh, the social shock of occupation and exile and destruction, 
Where would we get our hope from? Well, perhaps because God was going to take the initiative again. Where we had failed, he wouldn't. But he would start with something small. And if it's going to be the people of God, there was also the hope that he would use us too. Perhaps one day we would also have another opportunity to be part of his people again. Maybe he was going to plant us again in the land. Maybe we were going to uh, flourish and grow and and nurture the word and, and give honor and glory and even direct the nations towards the Lord. Then there was always the mystery bit. Well, I'm not sure how this was all going to work. And in the gospel passage, you see some very similar hints. But in the gospel parables, there is definitely the involvement of man. In the prophetic portion, God takes the initiative, as he does in all of our lives. But in the prophetic portion, he's the one that plucks that initial little branch and puts it in the ground. In our, in our two parables that we have, and in, in, um, we're in lectionary reading B, for those that might not be in the know, that means this year we're reading Mark. I'm going to read all of his uh, material, including a lot of parables. I think um, we, we owe it to a, a professor, a friend of this organization, Professor Steve Notley, who, if I'm not mistaken, founded Shoresh. Is that true? Yep, one of the ministries here at Christchurch in CMJ. It's an excellent uh, organization. And um, he had, has done a great study on the parables. The parables are a very unique piece of Jewish literature, a device to teach. Parables only occur in the Gospels and in rabbinic literature. You don't find parables in the Gospel of John. You don't find parables in Paul. They're not in Josephus or Philo, and they're not sitting around in Greek, uh, Greek literature. They only occur in rabbinic literature and in the Gospels, which is a very interesting um, finding. They also have nothing to do with ethnicity. The parables talk about a farmer who goes out to plant seed. doesn't say a Jewish farmer. doesn't say a Canaanite farmer. It's not a Babylonian farmer. It's just a farmer. And he plants in, in, a, in a field. It doesn't say where the field is. It's not an Israeli field. It's not in the land of Canaan. It's not in the land across the Jordan. It's just very generic is very interesting. Parables also don't use um, a Bible quote. They don't quote a piece of the Torah. They're they're blank. They, uh, and as um, Steve Notley put all, he found all 436 known parables, and he put them in a collection, and he discovered that they're all in Hebrew. They might be from uh, surrounding texts that are in Aramaic, like in the Talmud, but once you got to a parable, it was in Hebrew. And so Jesus, yes, most likely had an uh, Aramaic vernacular, as he's everyday speaking, but when he sat down to teach, particularly a parable, what language would he have used? Would have used Hebrew. To say otherwise would be speaking from, from silence. Very interesting find. Now, isn't that interesting? You have something that develops inside the land of Israel, that's inside the language of Hebrew, and yet is very universal in application. No ethnicity, no other generic, very generic plain markers. So it's something, a very unique device to teach. And as we work through the Gospels, we work through the teachings of Jesus, we'll have a lot of opportunity to read and discover these parables. And in Mark, we have, this is a unique parable to Mark, the parable of the growing seed. It only occurs here. The parable of the mustard seed occurs in some of the other synoptics. And as you guys probably know my tradition, I like to try and bring an image, some sort of uh, 
picture. Because um, most people will never remember the sermon, but they will generally remember the picture. Um, so you all remember what I spoke on last week? No, fair enough. Thank you, guys. But do you remember the picture that I had? Most likely, yes. People go, great. But here, I couldn't find one. I mean, there are a few pictures of the growing seed, but they looked so, ah, I couldn't. But in my discovery, I discovered that there's a church in Russia. There's a church in Russia where, um, it's an Orthodox church, the entire Gospel of Mark is in pictures around their entire church. The entire church, it's color. And that, isn't that incredible? So a couple of hundred years ago, if you didn't know how to read, you could still go to church. And you could still hold on to your son and say, son, let's do the Gospels. Let's start over here. And, and, uh, and when they get to the growing seed, unfortunately, it's just Jesus in front of a tree. But um, hold on to that image if you like. Because the, the, the point of, of both of these parables is something that was small succeeded. We usually like to talk, we, uh, and, uh, and Jewish people also expected, some, in terms of the messianic movement, something explosive, something dynamic, something gr- grandiose, something that would expand and grow fast. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we would all like revival. Does anybody here not want revival? No, we all want revival. And we've had revival in the past. We can think about Azusa Street. We can think about uh, the revivals in Pensacola. We can think about you know, revivals that occur through history. But eventually they stop. And they peter out. We're never sure why. But something didn't stop. And these parables describe something that seemed inconspicuous, didn't seem very strong, tiny little seeds, but they grew and they flourished and they bore fruit and they gave honor and glory to the Lord. And what I like about the way these parables and the, and the prophetic portion linked together is in the prophet. It's definitely the Lord's initiative. He says, I, the sovereign Lord, I will take the, the branch from the top of the cedar and I will plant on a mountain and I will make sure this, this, this plant grows and flourishes and it will succeed. I am the sovereign Lord. Hallelujah. And in the, in the, in the parables of this of the growing seed, there's a farmer, there's a man, a human, who's involved in what God is doing. There's some sort of interesting partnership. Now, why does God need a man to help grow his kingdom? Well, the first answer to that question would be, well, he doesn't, obviously. If God wanted to, he could appear in dreams and visions to anybody. He does, but he could do it to all nine billion people on the planet. Bang. We've all had a vision of Jesus. But there is something that the Lord delights in, in revealing to man through man, through Israel, through the Jewish people, through the church. He delights in it. It's not perfect. Oh my gosh, it's not perfect. We could have a look at the church and we could do all kinds of... Catholics don't like Protestants. Protestants don't like Catholics. Orthodox don't even like themselves. No one likes anybody. And isn't that a bit of a shame? We've all got the the Holy Spirit and yet we can't be united. And that was one of his tasks is to unite people. And 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 I'm hoping that we can be. But it still reflects the honor of God. This tiny little Jesus movement that was about 120 uh, Jewish people in, in the Galilee spread throughout the world. And now, here we are worshiping the Lord. Here you are online. You're, you've gathered to worship the Lord. When we finish, somebody else will start. Somewhere. Someone will start praying. 
Someone will be comforting each other. Someone will be going and visiting each other. Someone will be going to heal each other. Someone will be going to share with each other. Someone will be going to defend each other. It's happening. Might not be perfect, but it is happening. You couldn't stop it. The, you think about that. Satan could not stop the gospel. Which, how strong is he? He's not very. <laughs> and Paul says, we are confident. What are we confident of, confident of, dear Paul? Well, just about all things. Because you can't stop this tiny little thing. And somehow it involves the work of a human, as well as the Lord. It's the Lord's initiative. He defends, he nurtures. This man, he plants. And he does not know how it grows. We share the word. But we don't know how that works. We do not know how the spirit works in each other. But you know that he does. Because you can see it. There are two billion people who follow the Lord. Will say that they do today. That's incredible. I don't know how he did it. But he did. And it's absolutely a joy. In the Greek, actually, it uses the word automas, automatic. This is just automatically going to work. What an interesting thought. Or other verses. When I cast my word out, it does not return to me void. I am the Lord. It will succeed the task that I have given it. So there's this interesting, interesting partnership that you and I have. We don't do the saving, but we plant the seeds. Go into all the world and tell them about me and teach them to obey my commands. And so we see in the, in the, uh, the epistle that we are told to walk by faith, although the and I had lived, but walk by faith, as many of the other translations have, and not by sight. What does that mean? Well, if you think, put your Jewish hats on, when you think of the word walk, you think of halakha. It's a, a, a way of describing conduct and behavior. And there's a brother in this community um, uh, who's actually doing his PhD on... Halakha in the New Testament. All the ways where we, we read the word walk. Really looking forward to his conclusion of that, um, that, that, that paper. And so we walk out by faith, trust, not by things that we see. There are so many things we don't see, but we still walk. Paul doesn't admonish us to sit by faith. In fact, he says that in the end, we will all be given rewards for what we have done. Not for, the, not for sitting down doing nothing. Now this is not works righteousness, please don't accuse us of that, but it is obedience. And it is, it is part of that response that we have to that seed, that spirit that was put inside of us when we joined this, this community, the kingdom of heaven, this this great tree, whatever, whatever euphemism you want to use. And we joined the Jesus movement. And, uh, and in our walk and in our obedience, somehow, and in our love and, uh, and our acting out of compassion and, and, and mimicking the image of the Lord, loving as he loved and sharing as he shared and giving as he gave and having compassion as he does and being merciful and forgiving then that, uh, that, that, that attitude, that uh, behavior that we have, it gives honor and glory to the Lord. Let your light so shine before men so that men will see your give works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's, it's, it's just what we see here. And God started it all. Where we had not succeeded... And our heavenly king took a, took a, 
a branch from a cedar and he planted it. And it was small. Messiah, why not? But also the people of God. Something that started so small expanded and grew and got bigger and you couldn't stop it. When I was a lot younger and um, uh, working in Australia, I used to run a pub. That's okay in Australia for all of Americans that might be here. And we were finishing up. My wife and I were about to head overseas. Some of our friends said, so you're going to go traveling and you don't know where you're going to go and you don't really have a plan. You're just going to work yourself around the world. It's an Aussie thing to do. But aren't you a bit nervous and a bit scared? I said, not really. I said, I'm part of the biggest gang in human history. There's two billion people in my gang. Everywhere I go, I'm going to find some brothers and sisters. Somehow, I don't know how they did it or how they got to, to, to believe, but they did. And I can see it. I think it's visible to, to me. What's my role in all of this? Well, brothers and sisters, I join you in obeying the, the Messiah, walking by faith, acting out obediently to the teachings and the command of God, and we plant little seeds. How do we do that? In all kinds of ways. But it's something that we don't sit by faith, we walk by faith. And we plant little seeds. How? Some of us will share the gospel openly. Some of us will do it a little bit more quietly. Perhaps with compassion and kindness and a friendship, particularly when people are lonely. A brother this morning, he told me, the Holy Spirit even worked through my anger when I made a mistake. I was trying so hard to share the gospel with my cousin and he just wouldn't believe. Every time I would tell him, he would just yell at me and get angry. But one day, we were sitting down and he looked a little depressed. Life was getting to him. And I didn't know what to say other than to say in, in, in anger, you really got to get yourself fixed up with Jesus. No, seriously, you've got to work out how you and God are doing. And he expected to get yelled at again. But the, his cousin went, you're right. Wow, how did the Holy Spirit do that? Should I have gotten angry? Not really. But did it work? Absolutely. You can't stop this. Satan couldn't stop this. As uh, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my kingdom. What started as something small grew and gives honor and glory to the Lord. It's not perfect. It's the way he wanted it to work, though. He wanted you and I to participate. It's a treasure. It's a joy. It's a responsibility. It's a blessing. So I encourage you today to not sit but walk. We will all have to give an account of how we walked before the Lord, not sat before the Lord. We don't always see what's before us. In fact, most of us probably don't. I want to share a, a word from a Catholic, a Catholic archbishop, if I may, <laughs> We're, we're an Anglican church, we're a Protestant, but this guy, Archbishop Oscar Romero, does anyone remember him? Okay, he was a Archbishop of El Salvador. He was an outspoken champion of justice, and he was murdered because he was telling some of the gang lords about what you should and shouldn't do. So he wrote, and it fits well with this idea of something small, Growing, unseen, but unstoppable. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing just that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning. It is a step along the way, 
an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end result, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. The Lord knows exactly how to grow his church. He really does. He knows how to put his heroes in the right place. He knows how to give good gifts to his people. He knows. So we can trust him in that. We can't always see how he knows, but he knows. And we walk it out as brothers and sisters, together, part of something that's bigger and it's unstoppable in the face of the enemy. So have confidence before the Lord. Have confidence before the enemy. Have assurance of your forgiveness and the fact that God loves you very much and the people around us. And may our actions bring honor and glory to the name of the Lord. Amen.